operators today. No, we all, we record all the meetings uh, so, and anyways. Okay, perfect. Hi everyone, welcome to this webinar on the application of AI in construction projects. I am Sina Moradi, CIB program manager and postdoctoral researcher of construction management at Tampere University in Finland. Today we have this great pleasure to have Professor Mohammed Kasim and Dr. Anya Khodabakhshian as our keynote speakers in this event. The event is being recorded and will be available in CIB's YouTube channel, so you can watch it later. Uh, so, without uh, further ado, let's uh, proceed uh, with the first presentation by Professor Mohammed Kassam. Thanks, thanks a lot, Sheena. I'll share my screen just a second. Yes, go. Okay. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks, uh, Sheena, uh, for the invitation. It's my pleasure. Hi to all attendees online and. Uh, I'll, uh, as Sina mentioned, I'll be talking about Construction Digital Twin, which is basically about uh, the application of Digital Twin on construction sites. Uh, I'm, I'm Professor uh, Mohamed Kassem. I am at uh, Newcastle University. Uh, my uh, role is a full professor of digital construction management. And you can see another name there, Wahib Saif. He's my... Uh, uh, one of the several PhD students I have, but this in this case I put his name because most of the content in this presentation comes from his PhD. And uh, as a professor of digital construction management, what do I do? Uh, as you can see on the screen, basically uh, with digital construction, we refer to a whole suite of uh, uh, novel technologies from digital twin, of course, to data analytics and AI and ML, to IoT, to distributed ledger technology, of course, also to BIM. Uh, usually, the word construction in uh, digital construction doesn't refer, uh, in this case, it's in this specific slide, doesn't refer to the construction phase. It refers to the whole life cycle of uh, construction project, and that include planning and design, construction, use and uh, operation and maintenance, and as well as demolition. So I do, as an academic uh, specialized in digital construction, I do research uh, investigating uh, the application of these innovations across the project life cycle. I do research at two levels. One level is um, conceptual. I try to explain in my research what, what these technologies mean to the construction and uh, built environment sector. And another level layer is technical where I develop uh, uh, tools, algorithms, and new uh, application and new processes. For this presentation, it's not progressing the right. For this presentation, I'll briefly go through what you see on um, on this outline slide. Uh, I think you can't avoid not discussing what digital twin is. So we'll start with that, and then we'll move on to what constructing digital twin is. A little bit about. Uh, 
the interplay between BIM and digital twin because that's as well a, a very well known points of debate and discussion. And we'll move to the core talking about what applications uh, we have for digital twin on construction site, what technologies. I'll quickly go, of course, we don't have time to go in details through the case study. I have two case studies of digital twin um, on construction sites that we developed in our research group and a final message at the end. So when we talk about digital twin, uh, we often uh, uh, see um, lots of keywords, lots of very key terms that are flagged here and there in various definition, things like synchronization, real time, virtual replica, uh, mirror. Uh, however, I think we need to take this word cautiously. I'll talk in my concluding message, I'll talk more about this because I, I think in our built environment community, we tend to uh, borrow things from other sectors um, like manufacturing without much scrutiny. Uh, so, um, of course, these are all very well known uh, uh, characteristics of digital twin, but not all of them really apply for construction sector. So we'll try to um, uh, uncover uh, those like uh, true characteristics or more pertinent characteristics to construction as we go in my presentation. Uh, I'll try. I'll try to start with a simple example about what digital twin is. Uh, we have an individual here called Bob, uh, and wants to make a decision whether really drinking uh, a hot drink that he's holding uh, or not. So I'm sure I, I expect everyone is familiar with this process. Uh, so what it happened is. Uh, we feel sense it on our tongue. We have sensors. Uh, we have receptors. Uh, that uh, basically measures the temperature. They transmit that through a nerve that connecting our tongue to our brain. And that's the equivalent of the, you know, like uh, communication um, uh, technologies within a digital twin. And it goes to our brain, our cognitive abilities that quickly we um, process that signal and send us a, um, basically uh, an evaluation, which is in, in this case is too hot or it's okay to drink. And based on that, we do the decision. So where, why is this a digital, is this a digital twin example? And what, what, what's the digital twin in this example? So of course, you know, we uh, unless someone can argue against this, we are physical uh, individuals. So that's a physical part of the digital twin of the, let's say that's a physical twin. And the remaining part is a digital twin. Now, if you add uh, together digital twin plus physical twin, increasingly in the literature, we talk about twin systems. Uh, but you can see it's all about uh, basically data, converting data to information and information uh, informed decision and decision informed actions. And hopefully this example gives you a, uh, a simple definition of what digital twin is uh, or twin systems are. Uh, we have our own definitions that Wahib and I uh, have been working on, and you can see it's quite different from those bas from those characteristics you have seen in the point in the word cloud in in my previous slides. We talk about um, we talk about a, a system that's capable to process dynamic data. Uh, we don't talk about real time, and we will see examples later on in the case study. We talk about digital twin ability to process the data according to the temporal requirement of the application we have at hand. So we can't just talk about real time, borrow it from manufacturing and say it's real time. No, it's not always real time. And um, it's about translating data to actionable knowledge that inform decision making. So that's our definition. There is now an ISO definition. Uh, I don't have the ISO definition here on my slide, but it's very similar to the definition we are proposing here. So what's construction digital twin is then? Let's try to conceptualize it. Uh, not really conceptualization, but I try to put, you know, uh, uh, flash it out in terms of players that are involved in a digital twin. <clears throat> we have the construction site, the physical construction site. We have the sensing layer, you know, like the tongue example, uh, the tongue in, um, in our human um, uh, testing example. And then you have the communication layer in which basically could include 5G, include wireless network, could include other type of communication technologies. And we have the storage layer that include could include could be cloud based, could be various type of database technologies, uh, and so on. 
And we have the data analytics. Let me move these things here. We have the data analytics layer where we analyze the data according to a selected AI or ML machine learning algorithms. And from that, we uh, from that we could have two types of decision. We could have, for example, automated decisions that could be in real time or could be don't have to be in real time. If you think about an example for safety, uh, and I'm sure the uh, the is after me is that the presentation on uh, risk uh, risk management. So if it's on safety, very likely you need a quick decision. So it could be an automated decision making going straight away from the AI or ML to the construction site, or you could could go through a visualization um, a, a dashboard, or a, it could be a BIM model where stakeholder look at that uh, dashboard and make decisions that, uh, that, uh, that uh, they enact uh, on the construction site. So you can see there are various ways. In the two case studies uh, I will show you, will see one is uh, nearly automated decision making, the other one goes through a dashboard and then makes the decision that goes to construction site. Uh, so that's a physical twin, of course, and that's a digital twin, and that sum, the sum of both is a twin system. Now, uh, the work I'll show you, of course, I can't go in detail due to time. Uh, the work I'll show you wouldn't be great if we uh, do like a review of all digital twin research, uh, try to connect every application on construction site with its sensing, technology, sensing technologies, with its communication technologies, storage technologies, analytic technologies, visualization technologies and even data source that are captured on construction site. So we know, for example, if I want to do a uh, safety progress monitoring uh, um, uh, digital twin, I know exactly from that mapping, if I can, if I do the mapping the way I explain, I can know what sensing technology I need, what communication technologies I need, and so on. So this is what we uh, did in this um, review uh, research work with Wahib. These are the five layers I explained before that gives a little bit of details. I'm not going to repeat them. So sensing technology, sensing layer, communication layer, storage, analytics, and visualization. So uh, before going into uh, that review I mentioned, linking every application to its uh, technologies, uh, digital, specific digital twin technologies, let's talk a little bit about uh, the debate BIM versus digital twin. When Digital Twin started a few years ago, uh, started, of course, a long time ago in manufacturing and aerospace, but in built environment, really, the discussion picked up about five years ago. When it first started, uh, lots of people opposed it. They said, this is like just a BIM replant. There isn't anything new about Digital Twin. That's one one, one position. Another position, they said, uh, you know, there is no need for BIM anymore. You know, this is like a new generation of... Uh, of uh, modeling and uh, technologies and um, managing projects. So that was another position. Uh, everyone was saying, look, forget about BIM. And I have actually very well esteemed academics, they do that as well. Um, that was one position. And the third position was actually, uh, you know, like uh, BIM technologies and digital twin work hands in hand, they, uh, they can complement each other. And I think the best, the truth is that third one, where which is says really like there are technologies that complement each other, and how they complement each other, is this is the way they complement each other. So what role BIM can play in a digital twin? It can be, uh, it can be uh, like as a data source. If you think about the geometric and semantic data that BIM provide uh, to start with uh, to inform the geometric digital twin and also uh, and the digital twin as a whole. So BIM as a data source, it could be BIM as a storage layer, uh, as a data repository, <laughs> basically uh, the data from the construction site uh, that's coming through sensors that could be, that could use the BIM uh, uh, as a data repository and will be visualized in BIM. Uh, and finally is the BIM as basically um, the dashboard visualization in the uh, layer where decision are make uh, decision are made within 3D model. Okay, so this is the review I mentioned before. Uh, that's actually hopefully it will be published soon um, in automation construction. We shortlisted 112 paper and we did a thematic coding exercise to identify the digital twin application 
um, on construction site, you can see uh, the logic of uh, developing uh, the seven application. What you see here on um, on the right side, you can see the seven application of digital twin on construction site, quality control and assurance, probably smooth and controlling, safety and risk management. Interesting that's the presentation you will have uh, next. Uh, construction robotics and aut uh, automation, data integration and management, supply chain and logistic, sustainability and circular construction. So these are the seven categories that we identified following this uh, process of coding. Highly recommend for all researchers to really do, uh, to perform systematic review and thematic coding. It's very powerful to understand the state of the art in a certain, uh, in your area of research. Um, this is a number how, uh, the application um, uh, of digital twin on construction site were distributed across the paper. You can see the safety and risk management is the category that has most uh, papers because that's include, of course, you know, lots of application on safety uh, and lots of application on uh, logistic and so on. And progress monitoring and control is next. So uh, let's try to unpick this area more. How we, uh, what technologies are used, uh, what digital twin technology are used for each application. So uh, what sensing layer, what communication layer, uh, what data analytics are used. So if we do that, what you see here is, uh, for example, uh, uh, risk management, uh, safety and risk management as an application, you can see here in the white um, uh, circle, you can see, for example, in this case, we are visualizing application against technologies. You can see, for example, for safety and risk management, RFID, load sensor, uh, st uh, stress strain sensors are the most used IoT on construction site for this application. While if you look at, for example, uh, progress monitoring and control, you can find GPS, IMU, and telematics are the top three sensing technologies. So we have done that not only for sensing technology, but for every other technology layer. If you look now at, uh, if you look now here at, uh, rather than doing it um, uh, for each application, you we map all application of digital twin construction side against all sensing technologies. You can see the top three technologies that are used. So GPS comes first, followed by vision-based system like cameras, followed by RFID. And moving on to another technology, um, uh, sorry, for, to another technology, yes, used in digital twin. In this case, uh, in this case, sorry, it's not the technologies, are the data collected. So what, what data are used uh, and are collected across each uh, CDT application? Okay, so you can see here, for example, if I go back to uh, safety and risk management, you can see, for example, the most used uh, collected data is equipment on-site location, on-site uh, 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 labor location, uh, and so on. If you look, so you, you have you have a good really uh, mapping between application and data, application and sensing technology, and we do that for everything else. If we look at communication technologies, uh, for you can see across all. Um, uh, all seven application of digital twin construction, the most used communication technology is Wi-Fi, followed by MQTT protocols, followed by LoRaWAN, and so on. And, and in terms of uh, data analytic approaches, you can see, for example, um, sorry, that's in terms of storage, data storage. There is a mistake here on this slide. In terms of data storage, you can see, uh, for example, uh, Cloud storage is the most used, followed by SQL databases, followed by ROS type of databases, read optimized uh, databases. So going on as well, going ahead with uh, CDT application versus data analytics, you can see uh, across all application currently, manual or human interpretation is still the predominant one, followed by a convolutional uh, neural network followed by YOLO and so on. I'm sure in the next presentation you will see and you'll hear about these uh, methods. Uh, in against, in terms of uh, CDT application against uh, visualization, uh, in terms of visualization layer, layer here there's another mistake, it should be CDT application versus visualization. You can see uh, Unity and BIM models and point and cloud are the top three technologies used uh, as visualization layer within digital twin for construction site. Uh, 
benefits are uh, quite a lot of benefits. These are three key ones, enhanced visual visualization, on construction sides, there are lots of dynamic data that the BIM model and even 4D model cannot visualize unless you really implement digital twin kind of thinking. So you can visualize lots of uh, dynamic things on construction that that would be otherwise impossible to do. Project performance, you can um, monitor project performance, perform various type of analytics, including predictive analytics. You can improve project outcomes and there's there are already evidence in the literature from um, for digital twin in these areas. Efficient decision making as well. Uh, of course, you know, like uh, um, with digital twin application, you will be able to uh, develop decisions that you wouldn't, you could, you could either improve current decision with data-driven approach, or you can enable new decisions that you were not able before, for digital twin, you were not able to, uh, to do or to make. Uh, I'll quickly, I am aware of the time, let me check. Uh, I'll quickly go through, now I'm still okay on time. I'll quickly go through a couple of case studies. Uh, this one is a digital twin for monitoring s work operation and productivity. <laughs> it's a project that we have done over the last three years and we continue to do now with uh, more industry funding from the government and Wahib is working on this project as well. <laughs> so if you look at s work equipment and construction site, um, the utilization rate ratio rate is really low, is as low as 30%. There's lots of duplication and redundancy up to five times. And these data are actually from one of the largest civil engineering projects in the UK, HS2. Also, in terms of emission, uh, they really em they really cause lots of emission. Like, for example, al ar uh, in and around London, all they can make nearly 12% of all NOx emission. So it is really considered one of the biggest a productivity blind spot in the construction sector, the, uh, the S-work uh, productivity issue. So it's really important to target. <laughs> we had, uh, going back here, we had funding twice from the government to look into this problem. We had, we worked on it over the last five years. We identified the use cases. I wouldn't go in terms of its use case, but is there self-explanatory in this table? You have basically, uh, we can do better uh, estimation of equipment usage if we implement digital twin. Um, we can uh, estimate task uh, progress and uh, roll that up to uh, understand uh, program, basically uh, program performance and manage the program better. Uh, we could do lots of uh, things around traffic management uh, and that's quite easy to do uh, with uh, um, digital twin for, um, construction site, and we could monitor and report things like uh, compliance that are required uh, by um, region and government and cities uh, around, around project, of course, health and safety as well. And uh, some of the work we are doing, if you're interested in this space, what he is doing is we are developing a set of uh, something called smart metrics or KPIs as well for uh, construction sites that aren't only about equipment, but generally around, uh, uh, let's say, uh, construction 4.0 sites. <laughs> we developed a digital twin prototype um, that include all layers that I covered before, uh, the back end in terms of uh, the IoT in terms of uh, construction site. Uh, we used, uh, we tested various type of IoT, uh, um, then we uh, developed the back end, the data uh, communication. Uh, we developed the front end uh, for visualizing and making decision. We developed the AI uh, ML algorithm to estimate uh, productivity uh, of equipment and what they are doing. You have here some of the publication where we talk about uh, this work and you have here on the left side, the industry partner who worked with us on this project. Uh, this is an example of, uh, we at the university were responsible for the AI element. You can see some of the example here. Uh, we wanted to know uh, what an equipment is doing. Uh, I think something I haven't covered before. Uh, it's really important when you look at any technology within the digital twin to understand um, what your application require. For example, here when we used um, IMU and gyroscope and accelerometers, as the technology we had had a certain frequency that not good enough 
so that we couldn't capture what we want to capture in our AI in our ML algorithm. For example, we couldn't do what we call it the full cycle of, uh, for example, knowing if an excavator is swinging, digging, um, uh, and everything. So we were able we were able only to uh, know if it's operative, not operative, basically utilization ratio, and convert that into productivity. We tested various input in terms of features like. Um, uh, linear acceleration, gyroscope, plus noise. We tested all combination and different type of ML algorithm. At the end, we were able to achieve the best accuracy with DNN uh, using uh, noise, gyroscope, and linear acceleration data. And uh, we developed the front end where you could actually know what asset you have on construction site, where they've been, where they are queuing. Uh, it has an interface as well with the program, uh, program of Earthwalk, you know, like the Gantt chart, um, and and so on. Uh, should I skip this, Sina, and go to the last, if I, you don't have time? Uh, you have yeah. still four minutes time, so... Yeah, it's it's quick. It's only a couple of slides. Um, so that was when one case study, and uh, we were able to develop it um to a great, uh, I mean, we, we were targeting really a commercial software that can be commercialized because the funder required us to do that. We are, I, I wouldn't say we got there 100%, but we have a the skeleton of a good software that's raising lots of interest from the industry and, and investors as well. This is another case study that Wahib has led on recently is how to monitor safety on construction site. Uh, Without going into depth of this, but uh, this is a um, basically um, industry technologies that exist out there. We used a 4D model platform uh, from a company called uh, what's the name of the company? I'll, I have it on the next slide. The 3D Repo, 3D Repo, and we use sensing technology by by, by, by uh, another company as well. These are commercially available. So what we do is within the 4D uh, model, we can. Um, we can mark up or indicate the hazard zone uh, for intrusion, risky intrusion. So, and 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 that um, uh, mark up within the 4D model is synced with the IoT. So the IoT uh, co consists of a geofencing IoT. So we'll reflect those uh, data from the 4D model and perform a geofencing on the construction site. Then laborers that have helmet with sensors, when they approach that um, um, uh, that hazard zone within 50 centimeters, uh, the system will alert them and the position will be recorded within the 4D model. So you can see the system here. Um, you have the helmet with the sensor, you have the geofencing uh, technology. And uh, what you could do is basically record all um, position of every laborer and uh, and you can see the green one are okay the black one are intrusion risky intrusion where uh, laborer were alerted to stop not go into that area because they are not allowed to go in that area otherwise there will be uh, it's unauthorized areas are not supposed to be there and you have all the data analytics in terms of uh, um, those uh, those intrusions when they happened, and you have as well who was involved as well. Which again, this is an unethical point of view needs to be discussed. So who was involved in that intrusion? The interesting thing about this system is uh, you can pay it back. So you can pay it back like five days, ten days, whatever it is, to review the safety and learn from it. And that's really a key a key feedback loop that digital twin enable that you don't have uh, compared to an environment where the, to a site where you don't have digital twin. Very interesting, it's important to say like, um, give the two example when I showed the type of feedback. One feedback was automated and real time, and this is an example of automated and real time feedback. While in the Earthquake, we didn't need a real time um, and automated feedback because the data, uh, we could uh, store the data uh, even um, in the cloud doesn't have to be real time and we can uh, uh, we can um, mine it and perform the AI whenever we need to do, to do it doesn't have to be real time and this is reflects the definition that we gave before about digital twin so a final message really which is about uh, uh, we uh, and I, I think I'm quite critical about how we operate in our built environment community we borrow things 
and we we rush to publish and we put definitions that are really all over the places. We need, uh, as an early researcher, you have responsibility really to to look after your domain and uh, um, uh, uh, and question things. Really, as a as a PhD or as an early career researcher, you need to be able to question things, not go with uh, with what everyone is saying. Uh, this is taken from uh, from Siemens. Uh, very interesting. I like this model. It talks about three types of digital twin, digital uh, dig basically design digital twin or digital product twin, production digital twin, and performance digital twin. I like this very much. However, I think as a conceptualization, it's very good, but we need to be, as I said, very uh, critical when we take things from manufacturing. And this is the example why. If you look at the manufacturing environment, everything is in place. You know, uh, even the IoT is fixed. Uh, the, operation gets repeated. the operation gets repeated every, uh, every day is the same. Uh, so it's quite stable uh, and repetitive environment. While if you look at the construction side, nothing, nothing, everything is dynamic. The laborer, the equipment, the logistic, even the product itself, uh, uh, of course, like uh, uh, evolve over time. So this is my final message. Let's be um, really uh, careful uh, how we transpose things from other domains because what we risk to do is uh, by promising too much in our definition of digital twin or um, inflating uh, um, the promises of digital twin in construction. And if construction, if our research doesn't live up to those definition, to those benefit, we risk really to uh, jeopardize uh, innovation and the speed uh, uh, and the digitalization of construction that we desperately need to keep pushing. So that's my final message. If you have any question about, you know, or you want to follow up about this or have uh, uh, more resources or be signposted, you can email myself or Wahib Saif, who is leading on uh, on this research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Qasem, for this uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, so let's uh, continue with Dr. Anya Khodabakhshian's presentation and we will taking the questions at the end. Thank you so much, Sina, and hello to everyone. Thank you so much for your invite. It's always a pleasure for me to uh, participate in CIB events, and I'm truly honored to be able to deliver this lecture today. Of course, uh, thank you so much to Professor Kassam for the very informative and nice presentation. I truly enjoyed that. Now, let me quickly share my screen and proceed with my presentation. So do you see my screen? Yes, Anya, you just need to put it on presentation mode. It is on presentation mode? Yes, yes. For me, okay, perfect. So um, the topic that I'm gonna to present today is on machine learning for risk management in construction projects, which was basically a recap of my PhD thesis. So just a quick background about myself. I am my PhD in architecture, built environment and construction engineering from Politecnico di Milano in November. And my background has always been in the area of construction project management. And uh, during this PhD period, I had the chance to uh, research more the applications of AI and machine learning for um, different construction project management purposes and also policy making on urban level uh, ethical considerations of AI and specifically risk modeling for engineering systems, not uh, merely the construction projects. Um, so construction projects in general are very complicated and unique and full of uncertainties and uh, conflicting activities and stakeholders, which create risks in our projects, which are uncertain events that if happen could have good or bad consequences on our projects like delays, uh, budget overruns, safety issues, accidents, etc. So what we should do, we have this risk management um, practices on different levels. It can be strategic and enterprise level, project level and operational level. 
which tend and uh, try to identify and assess these risks before they happen and try to control and mitigate them. So my research is focused mainly on the project level risks, not the risks that happen on a day-to-day -day basis, like operational level risks, which has its own uh, complexities in terms of lack of data generation on a very frequent basis, because for each project that takes two to three years to complete, at least, it's only one data entry in our uh, database. And the reason that I'm focusing on this is because my PhD was funded by um, Jacobs Engineering Group and the industry partners wanted to develop this AI-based application for their project management processes. So conventionally, risk management is not like this. The project managers, based on their experience and background knowledge that they have through managing different projects, they come up with a list of risks, list of risks for each project Let's say they know that if they uh, work with this specific contractor, they will do claims and they will have the budget overrun risks, for instance, or if they uh, construct this project in this specific region, the authorizations and building permits uh, are like a very long process, which would cause delay. So these are uh, things that they have learned through experience and not necessarily are very easily generalizable and passable to other project managers. So based on their experience and their subjective uh, judgment, they evaluate the probability and impact of each risk in a qualitative basics. And by the multiplication of this, they have the risk ranking. And they say, okay, if the risk ranking is high, then we give more priority to this risk. We allocate more resources to mitigate it. The problem of this conventional practice is that it's super time consuming, it's manual, and most importantly, it's highly subjective, relevant to the individual experience of each um, project manager. And they consider risks isolatedly without considering the interrelations and effects that these risks have on each other. So what's the solution? Of course, we're talking about the Industry 4.0 Technologies, which is a very big umbrella term. Uh, Professor Kossum very nicely um, uh, grouped them and tried to give an overview to different uh, applications that we have. Um, I'm more focused on the AI applications uh, through which three of them, which are machine learning expert systems and process mining, are the ones that have more um, application in the risk management domain. So the reason that we are interested in apply AI and machine learning in construction projects is that the amount of data, the variety and the velocity of data that is being generated in construction sites meets the big data uh, criteria. And we have these digital technologies like the IoTs, different sensors, cameras to capture this data. And then we have AI to learn from this stored data to do the informed decision-making for different processes and uh, to make these decisions more efficient, quicker, more optimized. So why not? Let's, let's use it. So the whole idea is that we have the input data in different shapes of text, image, video, et cetera. We have the machine learning applications, in this case, to learn from it and generate an output in the form of risk identification or a prediction or a regression or whatsoever. And throughout this process, that this slide is very similar to one of the slides that also Professor Kossum uh, showed, is that machine learning sits where in the process where we have had our um, data registry uh, technologies and applications, then we have the uh, pre-processing applications like text mining, computer vision, etc. Then we have the machine learning to learn uh, from this categorized data and generate some outputs in form of identified risks or their uh, assessments or whatsoever, and then uh, integrate this output inside our digital twin or project documents, 
uh, that we can use for further reference and further decision making. So what's the difference of learning in conventional mode versus in machine learning mode? In conventional learning process, we have the input x, and we know the formula that connects this x to our output y. So this is great for simple problems, but when the problem gets highly complicated, like the ones in construction projects, where we have tons of different uh, drivers and inputs, and it's not really easy to define this formula or these relationships, and we have huge amount of data to learn from, we give all this information to our model, all the inputs with the outputs, and by seeing and learning from them, the machine itself comes up with this formula that uh, relates our inputs and outputs. So for each new data that we have, or for each new project that we have, it can generalize the, the rule to that project to predict the value that we desire, in this case, the risks. So with that being said, the machine learning based risk management process would be like this. We uh, categorize the effective project variables like the project, budget baseline, the contract type, the delivery method, et cetera, the project type from our project documents like the project charter, project management plan, budget baseline, et cetera, with the collective experts opinion based on their experience of managing the project and then define the input as the effective project variables and the outputs as risks. For, so for each project, we have both the inputs and the outputs. For, uh, for each risk, it would be a yes or no, if the risk happened in that project or not. Then we fit this information to our machine learning model, and it will create the risk network, which is the causal interrelationship between the project variables and the risks. As a result of which, for each new projects that we have, given knowing all those effective project variable that is evident for each project, like the budget, the duration, all of this, it can automatically predict the risks, identify them and evaluate them. Uh, so it will technically automate the entire risk management process for us. However, the choice of which machine learning application to use is highly relevant on the amount of data available and in the role of probability in this whole uh, prediction process. If you have huge amount of data, we can use the deterministic machine learning models, like the black box models, which are which have very advanced architecture, and they use the frequentist approach for their inference, like uh, based on the frequency of uh, a risk repentance, they will say, okay, this risk is more uh, probable to happen. However, if you have limited data, which is the case for many construction projects, because the data registry is not very frequent or in a very structured form, the probabilistic models that assign probability to different answers, they do not uh, give a deterministic answer that if this risk will happen or will not happen. It would say, Let's say for 60%, it will happen. For 40%, it may not. These this probabilistic models have the advantage of using different sources of inferences and have the Bayesian statistics to support them, which might be better solutions for limited data. So the research scheme that I developed for two case studies that I will briefly share with you uh, is developing three different applications. The first one is the Bayesian network based on both experts opinion and project data, combining these two as a probabilistic model. I also developed another fuzzy logic model based on only experts opinion and a couple of deterministic machine learning models based on only project data in order to make the comparison and to understand for for this specific problem that is a limited database of projects, which one could perform better? So the solution among the Bayesian network uh, is a kind of probabilistic graphical model uh, consisting of a directed acyclic graph and a conditional probability table that assigns this uh, 
interrelationship between different factors, in our case, different variables and risks, in the form of three types of pro uh, probability. The prior probability of each node, the conditional probability between these nodes, and the posterior probability, which is learned and updated after seeing an evidence. The both of them, which is like the structure and our probability, can be learned from experts' opinion and project data. So the solution uh, scheme is like this. We have our project variables as our input nodes and our risks as our output nodes. So based on this, uh, this causal uh, probabilities of different project variables on our project risks, we will automatically predict the risks that will happen and with what, prob with what percentage or uh, probability they will happen in the project. So I also use the generative adversarial networks to duplicate the size of my database because it was only a database of 44 projects. It was super little. Uh, using generative adversarial network, I duplicated it to 88 projects. So artificially generated projects similar to the ones that we had. I'm not going much into detail uh, to be uh, in the time that I have. Uh, the second solution was the deterministic machine learning models, and it was a simple classification task. So as you see in this example, given that different features, have, let's say for an animal, it's living on the land, it has legs, it is uh, from mammals, etc., etc., then it classifies it as duck. It doesn't assign any probability to this answer. It says 100% it's dog. So it's the same for, for this problem. Based on um, the different features or the different project variables, and the class assigned is a yes or no for that risk. That will happen or not. And the, the structure of training and testing is like this. I fed that 88 um, data rows to the training process of the model and then tested it and compared the results of different uh, machine learning algorithms that you see here, basically decision trees, XGBoost, neural networks, et cetera, to do a comparison that which of them perform better. And finally, the fuzzy logic model that uh, unlike the Boolean logic that it's a definite yes or no, it assigns probability that says, not uh, it, it has like a, a fuzzy logic based on that. So um, if you say cold, it has a membership function to that temperature, you know, to being hot. So warm is 50% membership to, to being hot and uh, hot has 80%. So it has this uh, distribution and the uh, membership, sorry. So, uh, it is completely different on the logic behind it. So basically the structure that I used was asking the experts in the company to uh, give their linguistic evaluation of different risks based on different project variables, uh, like a liquor scale from very low to very high, and then uh, converted them, falsified them uh, to fit in my fuzzy interface system and then with the rule-based reasoning, I came up with the, with the answer that given these answers, will this risk happen or not, then defuzzified it to reach to this uh, value between one, uh, between zero and one as the probability of that risk happening. So going quickly to the case studies, the first case study was 44 projects with 46 project variables and 11 risk categories that I did three phases of surveys with the project managers for the structure learning, parameter learning of the Bayesian network and the network validation and for the fuzzy logic. And here you can see the uh, sensitivity analysis of different uh, variables in, inside the case study that I had. And uh, the result is something like this. For instance, this is the procurement risk network learned only based on the expert opinion at the moment. As you see, the prior uh, probability of all the factors is the same. They have the same percentage of, let's say, COVID happening or not happening. And based on that, it uh, made a 
prediction of the probability of each risk happening in the end. Then I updated the beliefs by the project data that I had, by the, the those duplicated 88 project data that I had. As you see, the priors have changed based on uh, my database. As a result of which, also the prediction of the risks changed. And how this works for any new project, if the project manager sets this, uh, the, the, the value of each variable, let's say the number of contractors, it's one. We have one general contractor. The COVID happens for that, for instance, or project type is a commercial project, it automatically uh, predicts the value, or uh, predicts the probability of that risk happening or not happening. So we can set a threshold and say, let's say, if the probability is more than 50%, we identify that risk in our database and we give it a priority based on this percentage. And finally, as a comparison of uh, pre and post data augmentation, you see that after data augmentation, the model uh, had the better results. And in general, within all the categories, I reached a minimum of 85% accuracy, which was a really good accuracy for such a small database. Uh, for the deterministic models, they generally had a good percent, uh, had a good uh, accuracy, but most of them had the overfitting problem because it was a small database. And for the fuzzy logic model, the problem was that the fuzzy logic model was over risk averse. So it was assigning higher probability to the risks. It means that project managers technically are more risk averse, while the deterministic model based on only project data had very low probability assigned to each risk. But the Bayesian network, using both of these uh, data sources was offering a better, uh, more realistic uh, prediction of each risk. So it was balancing basically the, the, the prediction. The second case study was a much bigger uh, database of more than 13,000 uh, school buildings, uh, a database of school buildings in New York, uh, where the delay and cost overrun risks were uh, studied. And since it was a much bigger size, as you see, the HD boost, which is categorized in as the deterministic machine learning model, outperformed the probabilistic ones for both uh, scenarios. And the reason is basically the complexity and tree-based reasoning and boosting method of HD boost and uh, the regularization. Uh, process which it panelizes over the compli uh, complex models uh, was in the favor of XGBoost. And in general, the size of the database was in favor of the advanced structures of deterministic models. So as a, as a conclusion of all of this, the, I had some success criteria for my research. The first one was to automate the risk management process, which all of these three applications can, can do. To compensate for data limitation, which was a real problem that I think all of us will have when working with industry partners. So I use data augmentation using GANs and integrating subjective and objective sources of data, which increase the accuracy of the model and uh, uh, perform better for limited database. Uh, I wanted to, have an accurate and objective risk assessment that I compared these three models. And as a result, I understood that the Bayesian network model was the most balanced one. And finally, gaining the trust and acceptance for application in the industry that the probabilistic models and the white box models in general are more understandable and trustable for wider application in the industry. So my final solution based on all these criteria was the Bayesian network for the risk management. And um, just a final recap, of course, machine learning based models for project management, for risk management could be highly beneficial in the, for, in the term of automation, optimization, 
and can foster informed and strategic decision making and help uh, quantify and generalize the subjective judgment of the experts in the industry. However, always this data scarcity and lack of open access databases in our sector is a bottleneck for wider application of machine learning and AI. And the reliability and trust issues and the lack of technical knowledge in uh, from the uh, professionals in our field uh, could be hindering. So it is our, uh, I would say, calling as researchers to bridge this gap between academia and industry and uh, bring up new innovative solutions uh, in the form of, in this case, AI-based solutions to our projects. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, I would li like to be contacted with you and uh, please uh, contact me in, in, if you have questions. I would like to collaborate in the future. And once again, thank you so much, Sino, for your invite and for giving me this platform to share about my research with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Anya. It was a great pleasure to see your uh, insightful presentation. Uh, and I also appreciate uh, Professor Qasim's for being here and uh, presenting uh, those really informative and insightful slides and the content both from a theoretical and practical perspectives about um, AI and uh, its application construction projects. So now uh, we have uh, almost three minutes time. If anybody has uh, any question about the presentations, please uh, feel free to ask. I would like to ask a question from Professor Kasim if there are no sure, other yeah. questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there is a question in the chat actually. So uh, yeah. let's maybe. What are the key challenges in what, what happened? Uh -huh. What are the key challenges in constructing a digital twin for infrastructure projects? Yes, yeah, this is actually a very interesting question. Uh, there are lots of challenges. Um, uh, I think the biggest one is um, there isn't enough, um, I'm talking here about general practice-based challenges, there isn't enough knowledge in the industry um, uh, to implement um, a holistic solution in terms of uh, knowing what data to capture, um, how to store that data, how to make decisions about that data. There isn't that maturity within the industry. At technical level, um, I would say uh, it it should be feasible. There is uh, all sort of IoT, uh, all sort of uh, connectivity construction sites. There are now actually dedicated wireless network for construction sites. You put one or two, they cover the whole construction site with how, with really good uh, good ability to capture the data. Cloud computing is becoming cheaper. Uh, AI is becoming easier to implement. That's not not much really from technical point of view. The problem I think is from uh, adoption point of view. Uh, there are lots of uh, construction company collecting lots of data, but not knowing what to do with it. Every conversation I have with uh, large contracting companies, they don't talk about. We say we had enough with constru smart construction site. We want to know what can we, how we can monetize the data, how we can make better bottom line result for our business, how we can convert that into a better construction project, better profitability. And uh, I have actually responded to those uh, requests several times came through uh, industry leaders. I have now, I think he's attending here, Abdul doing a PhD on that subject, how we can really um, make better uh, decision at, uh, business, at the enterprise level through all these smart construction site. So we're coming up with a concept called Enterprise Digital Twin. We have a conference paper upcoming with Abdul in the EC3 conference in uh, Greece next July. So hopefully, uh, you know, uh, uh, Akash uh, who asked the question, if you follow that, we happy to share more, more about this. Thank you very much. Uh... Professor Qasem. Anya, one question for you in the chat uh, by James. So you may. Uh, 
We get started in determining uh, relevant inputs for the problem we are looking for. So, um, so in my case, in my experience, it was because I had this actual industry partner for my research that they had a specific need. So basically, uh, it was somehow a requirement from, let's say, the client of the research in this case. So they knew that they wanted this application for their project management office or the risk management. So it was quite clear. And uh, the, the relevant inputs, it was, a, a part of it was determined by the company saying that, yeah, we, we can provide you this information, but there were a lot of other information and inputs that were not registered in, in the project, um, project documents that I had to do rounds of interviews and surveys to ask from uh, project managers, because as I, as I mentioned, usually in our industry, in the classical form, uh, many things are being done uh, intuitively or experience-based and not registered anywhere. And I think it is a bottleneck of our industry, data, poor data registry. Um, so I think this is something that you cannot define 100% from day one, but it is like a try and error process that you learn more and more what what other information or documents uh, or, or data you need for your model throughout the time. So that's a short answer. Thank you, Anya. You may now ask your question from uh, Professor Kasim and uh, mm -hmm. Any further questions, if there are? So now our participants. There's can... another question for me in the chat. Uh, what do you think about large language models be utilized to enhance risk analysis process? Yeah, of course. For given that most of uh, the information in project in construction projects are registered in the form of text and uh, not not very numerical, quant quantified, and not very easily perceivable by the machine, definitely the large language models could help greatly to, to pre-process this information and to extract information from the, um, the classical formats of data registration in, in construction projects. So um, for, for risk, again, as I say, like, because risk is at the end of the time, at the end of the day, it's a, a mathematical problem and we need that uh, numerical inputs and outputs. So um, I would say it can contribute a lot, but we still need that mathematical model as a backbone to help it. So I haven't specifically researched on that, but sounds like a very super interesting avenue to pursue. Yeah, may, may I add something quickly to that, yeah. Anya? Uh, I think to the NLP or chat GPT type of uh, uh, and risk management. I think if we talk about risk identification, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. you have uh, a registry of, uh, you know, information in a uh, documented about uh, 400, 800 risks that happen in a construction site. There are already some papers out that, that found that uh, technologies like a chatbot and uh, L uh, LLM technologies like ChatGPT are outperforming human in identifying risks. Uh, so it's interesting. It's an interesting space. <laughs> yes. It is exactly. Indeed. Thank you. And so... yeah, my question from Professor Kasem was that I the, the work that you presented about the safety monitoring was super interesting. And I wanted to know, like, the result is remaining uh, for, like, monitoring, per, like, performance monitoring purposes, or it also... Uh, becomes an input to the BIM model in any sense to, you know, prevent future this just for monitoring or for uh, making decisions to prevent uh, similar cases in the future. Absolutely, I think it's a spot-on question, and that has to do with the uh, role of BIM in the digital twin. Sometimes it's a data repository, sometimes it's a sensing layer, sometimes it's a you know a review and decision-making layer. In this specific case, it's for both for monitoring and for reviewing. So for monitoring, it um, it does the monitoring in real time. And um, for reviewing, because you have all the registry uh, and it's a visualized as well, not only it's not you know, text-based, it's visual-based, you can play it back for as well learning and uh, 
uh, generating lesson for future projects. So it can do both. Okay. Thank you. But by the okay. way, that was a project like for uh, you know AstraZeneca pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. So it, it's quite it, it's very early on and it's quite experimental. It's industry led. It's not academically led. It's industry led uh, project. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so our time is up. We have spent five more minutes than uh, we had planned. So many thanks again to our keynote speakers uh, for their wonderful presentations. And also I appreciate our uh, participants uh, who were here and present in this uh, webinar today. And I'm sure that uh, you all enjoyed this uh, uh, informative presentations and then the discussions at the end. So let's close this webinar. I wish you all uh, the best and uh, have a nice evening. Thank you so much. Have a nice evening. Bye-bye. All right.